Hello, my name is Neve Brennan. I work as the Archivist for Donegal County Council's Archive Service, the County Archives. This is a presentation focusing on the history of Glenty's workhouse. The original records are held with us. Under the Poor Law Ireland Act 1838, Ireland was divided into 137 Poor Law Unions, or districts. The unions were controlled centrally by the Poor Law Commissioners. Each union was run by a board of guardians whose duty was to oversee the running of each workhouse. In Donegal, there were eight unions and a workhouse for each one. There were workhouses in Ballyshannon, Donegal, Dunfanaghy, Clenties, Inishown, Letterkenny, Milford and Stranorder. Clenties union included the extreme western areas of Donegal, such as Ardra, Dunlow, Annagree, Clenties, Doohery, Ironmore, Fintown, Kilcar, Killybegs, Burtonport, etc. The 1838 Act gave a number of powers to the Poor Law Commissioners and through them to the Boards of Guardians to build and manage workhouses and to collect rates. The Commissioners were also authorised to, to direct guardians to raise money via rates to assist in emigration. Guardians were granted the power to relieve and set to work the destitute poor as by reason of old age, infirmity or defect may be unable to support themselves and destitute children and others who cannot support themselves by their own industry or by other lawful means. The Act proclaimed the responsibilities of both parents for their children and adult children were deemed to have responsibility for support of their aged parents and to repay to the guardians any relief paid to their parents. Relief granted to individuals under the Act was deemed to be a loan. No one had a statutory right to relief under the Act. The Act made it an imprisonable offence for a man to desert his wife or child if such desertion resulted in his family becoming destitute and having to be relieved in the workhouse. Half of every Board of Guardians was made up of Justices of the Peace, often not resident of the county, but who held property there. Ratepayers and property owners elected the rest of the Board. Let us look at the setting up of Glenty's workhouse. The minutes of the Glenty's Board of Guardians record the first meeting on the 24th of September 1841. Following a vote by the 20 members of the board, John Crumley was elected chairman. An evaluation committee was also set up. The major early task of each board was to set about sourcing a suitable location and site for a workhouse. Early meetings in Glenty seemed to have focused on the dilemma of whether its workhouse should cater for 400 or 600 paupers. It was pointed out that the difference financially only amounted to £200. And disputes also arose over where the workhouse should be located. One member, William Walker, pressed hard for Ardra, but the board, on a vote of 13 to 6, chose the town of Glenties, describing it as the most appropriate seat for the workhouse. The boards were assisted in their unfamiliar work by the Poor Law Commissioners, specifically Mr Otway in the case of Glenties. He attended several meetings, including one on the 11th of February 1842, and stressed that he could not say for sure whether a building which would only accommodate 500 people would be sufficient. He did, however, add that the population of this wild mountainous district, who have almost all small holdings of land, are not likely to afford as many applicants for workhouse relief as the population of other districts of the county. The building of Glenty's workhouse took a long time and was beset by many problems which would strike familiar notes today. The unsatisfactory state of the building itself once constructed was a source of anger among members. It was May 1846 before the building was ready to take in paupers and not a moment too soon as the effects of the famine encroached upon the smallholders through the county. At that stage matters had moved on to the extent that the board has been forced to cast around for a suitable building for a fever hospital, deferred until the opening of the workhouse. Prior to opening, the board concentrated its efforts on employing a master and matron and porter and on furnishing the building. This is um, a photograph of the town of Glenties around 1900. It's a Lawrence photograph from the National Library. At the very bottom, if you look carefully, you'll see the workhouse and how it dominated the town. But it's, there's no remains of that workhouse today. So this is uh, a photograph of Letterkenny Workhouse, which is the part of Letterkenny Workhouse, which is the county museum today. This is Ballyshannon Workhouse, the most intact workhouse surviving today, owned by the County Council and the HSE now. This is Dunfanaghy Workhouse Heritage Centre.
The other main issue that occupied the board for these early years was the valuation of the union, which was as slow and painstaking a task as the construction of the workhouse building. The issue of rating was a bone of contention among members. At one board meeting, it was, it was resolved that because the union principally consisting of mountainous, sparring and unproductive land, the value of its property to poor rate taxation does not exceed one half of that of some of its neighbouring counties or unions. The rate was finally made on the 21st of November 1845 at one shilling in the pound. Another early duties of the Glenties and other boards um, was to employ personnel to proceed with a programme of vaccination against smallpox under the Vaccination Act. A medical officer was appointed in March 1843 and centres of vaccination were proposed according to electoral division. For example, Ardraw and Mina Valley were established as vaccination districts with Ardraw as the centre. Poor Law Commissioner Otway stressed the importance of proceeding as soon as possible with this programme of vaccination so that the current system of quackery be quashed. But like so much else, progress was painfully slow. The Poor Law Commission's report of 1842, showing the numbers successfully vaccinated in each union, only mentioned three Donegal unions, and Glenties had not commenced at that stage. The medical officer reported only six people successfully vaccinated in December 1843. But if we skip a number of years and look at the report for 1855, all eight unions are involved in vaccination, and Glenties has the second highest record of vaccinations in the county at 582, so things did improve. From 1845, the failure of the potato crop came to dominate the procedures and duties of the boards of guardian throughout the whole country and the county of Donegal. In November 1845, Glenty's members expressed anxiety that they would be unable to cope with the spread of disease in the potato crop, especially given that the workhouse had still not been opened. The following January 1846, minutes suggest a lack of understanding of the full impact of what they would have to deal with. It was decided to go ahead and employ workhouse staff straight away in order to meet any cases of destitution that may arise from the general failure of the potato crop. Food in the workhouse during and after the famine was always grossly inadequate. Glenty's workhouse early famine diet of oatmeal, milk and potatoes for breakfast, dinner and supper with a separate diet for those in the infirmary was reduced over the later famine years to even less potatoes and oatmeal and milk. Potatoes were replaced with yet more oatmeal while the master and matron had meat and bread in their diet. At times of real desperation, the inedible Indian meal was then given. Supplies were hard to come by in those years, and even milk, sweet milk or buttermilk, was unavailable. At one stage, replaced with sugar water. By 1848, the board was trying to feed the outdoor relief paupers as well as those resident in the workhouse. And at that stage, the diet consisted largely of Indian meal, rye bread and stirabout, oatmeal mixed with water. Diet did improve in the workhouse as the decades wore on. It included food with more protein and vitamins, bread, meat, even fruit, etc. The supply of food products was a desperately slow, slow process in Donegal during the famine, as several minutes from Glenties and other unions relieves. On the 7th of August 1846, the board urged the Poor Law Commissioners to tell the Relief Commissioners of the urgent necessity of forwarding large quantities of Indian meal to the ports of Teal and Killybegs and Port New for the use of the poor of this union. They informed the Commissioners of the general and total failure of the potato crop throughout the Union of Glenties, seeing every field and garden quite decayed and the tops withered down to the earth and in some places the people obliged to dig 50 or 60 yards before they can get a sufficient quantity of sound potatoes for one meal for a small family. and They not fit for work. The union was permitted to try to get meal to these ports. Two weeks later, a passionate letter by Daniel McDevitt, clerk of the union, addressed the board, outlining the increase of distress, and describing poor people coming a distance of nine miles for stones and half stones of Indian meal, and not a single pound was to be had in Glenties for the last four or five days. People have totally given up using their potatoes. Again, the board asked for meal to be sent to the ports, consigned to either the Coast Guard inspector at Ardra or to a Captain Bates at Killybegs by steamer. Glenty's guardian's desperation is evident. Even the tainted potatoes are too bad now to use. The union deplores the melancholy calamity in which seven-eighths of householders are small farmers and occupiers whose existence at all times depended upon this article of food in a union where neither grain fills nor ripens. 
or if so, its progress is so slow in coming to that state of perfection that people can have no relief from it for months. Therefore, a famine presses, unless people be immediately relieved by the speedy and benevolent intervention of the government in affording them provision at first cost price and giving them some general system of employment. Especially affected in the Union, apparently, were Fintown Glenties and Jerry Lachan. Lack of supplies coming in threatened the closure of the workhouse in 1846. The guardians complained of having no funds to purchase supplies. Problems included having to deal with profiteers who managed to obtain meal and were apparently selling it openly in Glenties, while the guardians had no money themselves to purchase. Lack of funds prompted the Glenties board to condemn bitterly those who refused to pay poor rates, resolving to sue absentee, absentee landlords and agents who could afford to pay. This was in November 1846. One such case was the Marcus of Cunningham, who refused to pay arrears of poor rate to the gar guardians on the grounds that his tenants had been subdividing the land on his estate for years. For 18 years, in fact. Entirely unimpressed with his argument, made at a time when those same tenants starved, the board solicited the poor law commissioners to issue legal proceedings against him. And in June 1848, the board referred to its own financial embarrassment. In January 1847, the rapid spread of disease prompted the medical officer to refuse to admit any more to the infirmary as it would be injurious to the health of the inmates. Desperate to cut costs and get supplies, Glenty's board resolved in March 1847 to set able-bodied paupers to cut turf for use in the workhouse, a saving of £100 to the union. It was increasingly impossible to obtain turf and coal contractors in that part of the country. Later that month, the master was instructed to admit up to 650 because of the huge numbers of desperate, starving people gathering at the workhouse door every day. But this was countermanded by the doctor, who again refused to admit more than 480 because of the range of fevers and other diseases rampant in the workhouse. In 1847, the right to relief of certain groups, including the destitute, was recognised, and at this time, outdoor relief, that is, relief in the form of food or work to be obtained outside of the workhouse, was sanctioned. Fever hospitals established during the famine years were in Burtonport and Dunlow and later Glenties. Hundreds died before or after being admitted to the workhouse. Glenties board records how a discharged pauper, John Boyle, was found dead two and a half miles away on a country road and was conveyed back to the workhouse by the constable, where problems arose as how to bury him. Another minute describes how hastily dug graves near the workhouse walls were not covered properly. This is a photograph of Ballyshannon workhouse about 10 years ago, and this is upstairs in the workhouse. This is the type of dormitory, the slats, the wooden slats where people had to sleep. Emigration. Emigration to the New Worlds of Australia and America was regarded by the state as one solution to the privations of the Great Famine in the late 1840s. In 1848, the British Colonial Secretary initiated an emigration scheme to send orphaned young people from Irish workhouses to South Australia. It was decided that women and girls in particular were needed in the colonies to balance the mainly male population there. So from the 1840s and throughout the 19th century, through assisted emigration schemes, teenage girls as young as 14 were sent to Australia, including from Donegal workhouses. Whole families were later sent as well. This is an image from the National Archives website of the ship, the Derwent, with people from Donegal emigrating during the famine. One can only imagine how frightened these very young people were at being sent so far away without parents or family from their small farms and villages in often remote Donegal, such as Glenties, to the other side of the world. After the famine, information on the lives of individual residents of the workhouses exist in the indoor and outdoor relief books and admission and discharge books. The two Glenties registers of persons discharged from and admitted to the workhouse, dating from 1851 to 1896, record the details of inmates, including their name, ages and gender, married or single, adult or child, with children or without, condition on entry to the workhouse, for example, clean, ragged, dirty, disability, if any, including lime, lame, blind, old age, fever, etc. Details include when each patient was discharged or died. For example, in April 1851, number 305 in the register was Catherine McGill and her family from Ardra. She was aged 35 on admission, a widow with her son Daniel, aged 12, 
and two daughters, Mary, four, and Kate, one and a half. There were the Dugans from Annagree. There was Mary, a widow with six children, and Biddy Bresland, whose husband was a migrant in Scotland and who had three children. People came from all over the Glenties Union, and some, the homeless presumably, are described as being from the Union at large. The two Glenties indoor relief registers, dating from 1899 to 1907, give names and marital status of persons and in children's cases, whether they're legitimate or illegitimate, as it was so described back then. There's a column for religion, the vast majority being Catholic. Descriptions of condition of paupers include clean, ragged, drunk, orphans, pregnant, clean, etc. The health is described again, destitute, blind, asthma, heart troubles, etc. The clerk also notes in this column that the individual is ill enough to be sent to the workhouse hospital. Occupations include peddler, servant, dyer, labourer, plasterer, mason, carpenter, tinsmith, housekeeper, ragman, tailor, farmer, tramp, beggar. Previous abode, Tannand is noted, as the, the date admitted to and discharged from the workhouse. Life did begin to improve gradually for people after the worst of the famine years. Living conditions, even in the workhouse, improved, with greater variety of diet, less prison-like conditions, a teacher for children, less fever, disease and overcrowding. But there was never a solution to the depth of the problems in Donegal of poverty, unemployment and homelessness. As the 20th century dawned, home assistance, outdoor relief outside the workhouse system, began to replace the old workhouse system. Board of Guardians' increased duties now included public health, dispensaries and building of rural cottages for landless labourers. Less and less people needed to be admitted to the workhouse. And when they did, they usually spent less time there than in the past. After independence in 1922, the Free State Government set about dissolving the poor law system, amalgamating hospitals and abolishing workhouses to be replaced by the county homes and local hospitals. One happiness at their own dissolution is evident in the minutes of some boards, though Glenties accepted it as inevitable and necessary as early as March 1921. In 1922, all eight boards of guards in Donegal were dissolved, and the boards of health and public assistance, the board of health and public assistance of Donegal, came into existence instead. So, what is the legacy of the workhouse and of Glenties workhouse in particular? The most important factor concerning the workhouses of Donegal or of Ireland is that the stories of many of the desperate and destitute individuals haven't been lost. Those who died in the workhouses, those who survived because of them or in spite of them, men who broke stones who would carry the bodies of fellow inmates to their graves in the dead of night, women slaving in the kitchens or laundry or having to beg so their children won't starve, children orphaned, hungry, lacking stimulation or abused. What we have left is an incomplete history because not everything has survived, not every aspect of every story. Here you see, for instance, a rare photograph of the master of the workhouse, James Breslin, and some of the children from the workhouse, about 1910. The names of people long dead cannot be forgotten, nor can their suffering, as long as the records are preserved and historians with an interest in local, national, family and social history utilise the records to keep their stories alive. Donegal County Archives holds thousands of records on the boards of guardians and other records from 1840 to their dissolution in 1922. There are 86 volumes of minutes of the meetings of the Glenties Board of Guardians from 1841 to 22, 1922, three registers of admission records, two indoor relief registers, financial records and other items. All the records of the Board of Guardians of Poor Law Unions can be found on findmypast.ie. And they will eventually be on our own website, www.dunigal.co.ie. Here you'll see some of the original archives, which are av available for viewing during normal opening hours in the, in the um, archives research room in Lefford. Thank you very much for um, listening to this talk and watching this talk. I hope you enjoyed it and have a nice day. And please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Many thanks. Stay safe.